Pod. Good. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, welcome back to uh, the la uh, last talk of the symposium. Um, there we go. Um, and uh, uh, once again, uh, this will be recorded. Um, we will take questions with the record. Any questions people want for the world, um, I will take while the recording is on. I'll turn it off so you can ask other questions you don't want the world to hear. Um, but uh, now I'll get started. It's a, it's a pleasure to have the symposium uh, close out with Graham Smith from, um, from Gila and uh, CEO Boulder. And he'll be telling us about the theory of quantum information. So uh, take it away, Graham. Oh, thank you very much. I, this week, something interesting happened I wanted to tell you about first. Uh, if you're interested in quantum information, here's a good book that you could use. This is, can you see that? Yes. Yeah, this is uh, John Watros's The Theory of Quantum Information book. I got this in the summer. But on Wednesday, one of my students came to me and said, did you ever look inside this thing? And I uh, said, well, no, because it's available online as a PDF. But what are you talking about? So he opened it up. And, and then he showed me this stuff. Oh, dear. <laughs> and, and in fact, if you go to the title page, it's some kind of general relativity textbook. And I wasn't sure how this happened, but I thought it was a reminder of the symposium, right? Because it's got quantum information here around the boundary. And, and then in the bulk, it's got all this general relativity. <laughs> and I, could, I, I was going to send it back, but I think I might keep it. Uh, OK, any, anyway, I'll, tell, I'll cover the quantum information -y stuff. And I'll say a little bit about what, what we're thinking in connection with, uh, with high energy physics towards the end, but mostly I want to give sort of an overview of what is, what do we, what is quantum information kind of uh, as practiced by, uh, by information theorists. So here's, here's the first information theorist, that's Claude Shannon, um, and he wrote a great paper that uh, basically introduced the whole field. Uh, and said that, you know, basically we're interested in communicating stuff or taking information from one place and sending it to another. And let's try to figure out the best rates that we can, we can do that at and when we can do that at all. Um, uh, humbly, I will, I'll point out that uh, the word information, the information in quantum information comes from information theory. Uh, and uh, 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 some of the most exciting things I think going on in, in, uh, in quantum information really are in this sort of quantum Shannon theory area, the area of uh, understanding optimal rates of communication, distillation, stuff like that. Uh, so there's lots of stuff like that. You might uh, look at, uh, try, oh, you, I can't point very easily. Do you see my cursor? No? Yes. Yes, okay, so over here, we've got Alice and Bob cooperating. They've got some, max, uh, some uh, mixed state row AB and they do some, uh, protocol where they communicate classically and do local quantum operations and they extract some entangled state. We might be interested in figuring out what's the best, what, how much entanglement can they get out per, per use or per copy of that state. Um, we might be interested in sort of, you know, pretty applied stuff like cell phones, uh, uh, sending messages to a tower, multiple phones are going to talk to the tower. The tower has to find some way to deal with the fact that they're going to be interfering. Um, or we might just be trying to send quantum information from one spot to another. And in all these cases, what we really care about is kind of what, what's the best you could possibly do with, with no constraint or basically only physics constraining what uh, encoder and decoder you could use. Uh, so quantum information theory, um, it's philosophy. First of all, I'm going to say something, maybe it's, well, I don't know if it's controversial. Uh, but uh, it's certainly a, a sort of, it's quantum information theory is a part of physics, um, but it's really different from uh, more traditional parts of physics. So one of the goals that we often have is to try to abstract away as much detail as we can. And with, by doing that, we find out kind of what are the fundamental limits nature is putting on, on information processing. And specifically, we find the broadest set of principles that can apply because we abstracted away a whole lot of detail. Um, the details left, they can give us a clear picture of quantum mechanics and indeed can help us understand traditional physics. This is how I see kind of the, 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 or this is one way in which the, the, the interaction of quantum information and high energy physics can, 
can be uh, can be fruitful. Uh, and actually, there's a it's it's maybe not just an aside, but it's not the only reason to study these things is that these strategies for approaching fundamental limits might actually be realizable either today or in the distant future. Um, so it's it's about physics, but it, it's it's about a lot of other stuff too, like geometry or computer science, engineering, and it's definitely a different flavor of more traditional branches of physics. So. Uh, maybe you can think of it as the, the the business of building very toy models of physics, just to illustrate particular things about quantum mechanics. Uh, and one big difference between what's going on in quantum information and what you find in like a classical uh, information theory um, uh, journal is that there are way more resources in quantum information and far more interesting interactions between those different resources. Uh, oh dear, I lost my mouse. Oh, here it is. So basic questions that we try to ask uh, are basically what, what are the resources um, in uh, quantum mechanics? Um, how can we interconvert them and can we interconvert them? How do the resources interact with each other and kind of what's the recipe for making those resources interact? So here I have a picture of a teleportation circuit. This is kind of the recipe for making uh, uh, entanglement represented by this state here and classical communication interact in a very non-trivial way to send quantum information uh, sort of in a distributed way, partially is as two classical bits and partially as kind of some residual part of a measured entangled state. And this is, I like this, this is a bread, uh, this is a bread, uh, 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 one of my favorite uh, bread, uh, what do you call a book that tells you how to cook? Um, recipe book. It's a recipe book. Uh, and one of the cool things about bread is actually the recipe's kind of on the cover of this book. It's, you could do an awful lot of things with just those four ingredients. Uh, and the whole story with bread right. is almost the whole story is how do you, how do you, what do you do while you mix those four ingredients? And you can get very different sorts of bread, very different tastes, very different levels of success by mixing the, those different ingredients in different ways. And uh, it's a similar story with mixing uh, quantum, uh, quantum resources at times. Okay, so uh, basic outline of the talk, I will sort of introduce some information theory basics and then talk about a specific um, sort of fundamental uh, object or, or um, quantity in uh, quantum information theory called the quantum capacity. Uh, it's it's basically the amount of quantum information you can squeeze through a noisy channel. Uh, and uh, I'll talk about why that's very different from, that problem is very different from the classical capacity problem. That's connected to notions of additivity and non-additivity of uh, entropic formulas. And uh, finally, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, our goal of understanding better uh, quantum correlations and specifically finding new ways to quantify the, the correlations in general quantum states, but also understanding those different kinds of correlations in holographic quantum states. So that should connect up to, uh, to what Matt was talking about in his talk just uh, half an hour ago. And just to keep me on track, I'll have my phone here. And uh, one of the central, or maybe the central notion in information theory is the notion of a channel capacity. So we imagine we have some communication resource and we want to know basically how many, how much stuff can you send using it? So here I have a picture of a, of a dump truck and its capacity might be measured in tons per load if I'm, if I'm, uh, if I'm trying to get gravel from one place to another. Um, for a classical communication channel, we might we will measure the capacity in in bits per channel use. Um, and what we have in mind is why per channel use is that you have a bunch of different a bunch of uses of the channel. Maybe this is uh, your this uh, uh, this uh, n cloud is your uh, your noisy channel at uh, at different uh, times. Maybe you've got a bunch of different uh, different. Uh, 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 magnetic domains in your in your hard drive. Um, what you'd like to do to send um, information across this noisy resource is find a way to take the message you're interested in sending, in this case M, and encode it into many uses 
where many copies of the input of the noisy channel in such a way that you can uh, extract from the outputs of those noisy channels what the intended message was, at least with pretty good probability. And the capacity is just, well, it's the most number of bits you can do that for um, uh, uh, divided by the total number of, uh, of channel uses. And you take the limit as, n go, as the number of channel uses goes to infinity, partially because, uh, well, uh, basically, that's the regime where you can actually find solutions. You can take advantage of the sort of regularity of the noise that emerges when you have a bunch of independent copies uh, um, applied to your, uh, to your message. And you can get, um, well, formulas for what this capacity of the channel is. So for instance, if I have a noisy channel that takes some input X and maps it to some output Y with this conditional probability distribution, the capacity in an operational way I can define as the best number of bits per channel use you can get in the limit of many channel uses. So it's kind of like, what's the rate of the best error correcting code you can come up with for this noise model? The kind of astonishing thing is that, that there's, a, there's a clean mathematical formula for this rate uh, that's given by this maximization of the mutual information between the input and the output, where you maximize over input uh, distributions. And uh, uh, well, I've put the entropy formula that down there on the right, this is just classical, uh, plain old classical entropy. And the mutual information is what you saw in the previous talk, the difference between the individual uh, entropies and the joint entropy. Yeah, that tells you how much correlation you, you, you look at this, you say, okay, that's how much correlation I can generate between the input and the output. And uh, then you can concoct, uh, basically using random coding arguments, uh, codes that come arbitrarily close to this rate. And you can show you can't get any better than this rate. If you have a code that has a rate higher than this capacity, uh, it's, um, well, the probability of getting the, uh, getting the right message at the output when you use that code is going to go to zero. So the nice thing that happened in the previous slide was that we had this asymptotic question and we needed, and we found an ant about how, what happens when you use many, many uses of your channel. And we found an answer in terms of a single use of the channel here, right? That lets us actually figure out what the capacity of a given noise model is. Um, that came about because in a classical setting, we have a property of capacities and um, more generally, uh, for most of the, the questions we know how to solve uh, for entropic formulas that tells us if I evaluate the capacity of, uh, of two channels, uh, a blue cord and a gray cord used in parallel, then the capacity of that big joint thing is equal to the sum of the individual capacities. Okay, and that allowed us to, uh, to, uh, to simplify substantially the formula for the quantum, the classical capacity of a classical channel. Um, basically, what additivity tells us is that the resources we have, they only interact in a trivial way. So a trivial interaction would be kind of like if you're making a smoothie and you add a little more pineapple, yeah, it tastes a little more pineapple-y. Uh, if you're making bread and you, you add a little more salt, uh, I can tell you roughly what it'll do, but it could substantially change the output, even if it's a tiny amount of salt. Um, similarly, uh, uh, if, if the water is too warm, uh, it might, it might, uh, it might uh, cause your bread to go flat while you're cooking it too. So um, non-additivities where we have sort of uh, beyond additive behaviors for the interaction of different resources, um, just uh, tell us that there's some kind of non-trivial interaction between the different things we're putting together. Uh, and they're kind of where, uh, where a lot of the magic stuff happens. So, we used additivity to find this clean formula for classical capacity. Um, be, sort of, it's not so hard to show that the Graham, classical- can I ask you a question? Yeah. Uh, on your previous slide, you had a greater than, it's, it's obvious that it could never be less than, is that? Y yes, yes. It, uh, I'm disconcerted because I recognize your voice, but I don't have a picture of, who is this? It's Matt. Okay, good. There we go. Uh, yeah, it can't be any less for the same reason you were you were actually talking about in your talk, uh, because you can always sort of separately use the two things in the best way possible, and you can achieve the sum. The fact that you can get even better than the sum 
of the capacities means that by using them together, you can you can do even better than using them individually. Thanks. Okay. Um, ah, so what we found, what we can find, kind of, you know, as you're trying to prove this um, capacity formula, is you can show first that if I evaluate this maximized mutual information on one use of the channel, that's an achievable rate. You can show that by using random coding. Um, and then you can say, well, if I have n uses of the channel, I could do random coding. I could think of that as one big channel. And then that means I can achieve sort of what we call the regularization of that, uh, of that optimized mutual information. Uh, so I can take the limit as n goes to infinity of one over n of this maximal mutual information evaluated on n copies of the channel. Since C1, this maximized mutual information is additive, then this, uh, this limit goes away and we just have to evaluate it on a single use uh, of the channel. Um, and that's actually going to be the, the step uh, in understanding quantum capacities or capacities of quantum channels that, that tends to fail or that often can fail. And what's gonna happen is that the coding strategies we know can get better and better as we consider them for, uh, for use on many copies of our channel. It's gonna be good for us because we get higher capacity or higher rates and better error correcting codes. It's gonna be bad for us because in general, we can't, we can't really do this kind of optimization when you have an infinite number of variables you're trying to optimize over. So let's bring in uh, the quantum stuff. Uh, basically the idea is to, well, the first time people brought in quantum effects into uh, information theory was you know, in the 60s. Uh, and when uh, Gordon and then later Holovo independently was looking at basically sending classical information in systems where quantum effects are important, uh, we better include the quantum effects to see what kind of noise they add to our, to our transmission. Um, uh, and in fact, if you look at this Gordon paper, it's quite nice. It has what we, what we call the, the Holovo information is in it as a kind of conjecture, conjectured relevant thing that Holovo later showed was indeed the right thing to be thinking about. Um, this was kind of quantum effects as an annoying source of noise in the, in, the, in the 80s. And later people began to start thinking about quantum effects as perhaps giving new capabilities, like with quantum money from Wiesner and uh, Bennett and Broussard's uh, QKD proposals. And more generally, they began to think about sending quantum information over quantum links. And, and in the 90s, thinking about doing error correction for uh, making quantum information more stable in the, in the face of noise. So we have, for a noisy communication link, a notion of a quantum channel capacity now. Um, it's just the amount of stuff you can send per use of the channel. If you want to send qubits, you send qubits, and you want to know how many qubits can I encode into the inputs of my channel so that when, I, when the receiver gets what I, what, what I sent, they can actually recover the original uh, state that I input. You might also be interested in just sending classical information over your quantum channel, in which case you get another capacity, a, a classical capacity of your channel. So there are the sort of three primary capacities of a, of a quantum channel are the classical, um, the private classical, and the quantum uh, capacity of the channel. So classical, you're sending classical bits. Private classical, you're sending classical information, but you want to make sure that only the receiver learns that classical information. It tells you roughly what, uh, what rates you can achieve when you're doing quantum key distribution. Uh, and the quantum capacity is really, it's the number of qubits you can send for channel use. It quantifies uh, the uh, performance of quantum error correcting codes. There are lots of other capacities you can imagine because there are lots of other resources you could be using in addition to a noisy channel. There's an entanglement assisted capacity. There's a quantum capacity assisted by classical feedback. There are capacities assisted by classical communication back and forth between sender and receiver. And all of them, uh, well, they generally tend to be different. And uh, depending on what scenario you're interested in analyzing, uh, 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 you may use those or uh, the ones that I've got here. What I want to do today is kind of take a close look, closer look at the quantum capacity of a quantum channel. Um, there's a similar story about these other, or there are similar stories about these other capacities and they each have also their own special features. Uh, but what I want to do is at least take a, a slightly deeper look at this quantum capacity because, uh, well, it's the one I like the most uh, but it's also kind of the, mm, I kind of think it's the best one to look at because it's, it's the one that tells us about how quantum error correction works, basically. 
And just as an aside, I'm going to talk about channels. They send messages from one sender to another receiver. There's an equivalent way of looking at things in terms of states. If you have a channel that maps A to B, you can equally well think of bipartite states uh, shared between A and B. And just like there's a notion of a quantum capacity, how much qu quantum information can you send from A to B, there's an analogous notion of a distillable entanglement. How much entanglement can you extract between A and B using classical communication? Um, basically, there's always a state version uh, and a channel version of any problem. And I'm going to focus on channels, but you could equally well focus on states and many, most of the things that, that uh, one finds just sort of map over directly, uh, uh, um, uh, even using the same kinds of arguments. Okay, so that covers our um, information theory basics and our um, look at quantum capacity. Um, I'm sorry. That does not cover our look at quantum capacity. This is our look at quantum capacity. Okay. Um, the quantum capacity uh, looks at this scenario. We have some quantum channel noisy here. And uh, I take some quantum state. I do an encoding so that I can feed it into a bunch of coffees at the channel. At the outputs, the receiver does a decoding. And it's a good code if you get roughly the same state out as you put in. And operationally, we just say, well, the quantum capacity is the maximum number of qubits you can get through with fairly high fidelity divided by the number of channel uses. And uh, it's sort of the, what, it's the best performance you could ever get uh, for uh, a quantum error correcting code designed for the noise model by this quantum channel. Can I ask on this? Yeah, uh, yeah. This is Veronica. <laughs> uh, in, the, in, in, in this um, um, situation, yeah. the approximation, the level of how well this output psi is approximating, approximating the input psi, yeah. uh, one might imagine that the capacity is very sensitive to it, but somehow that doesn't seem to enter your... That, uh, that's, that's right. So, so um, well, I can say two things. The first thing is that if you demand that it be exactly the same state, that's it is quite sensitive to doing that versus saying, you know, for every epsilon, there needs to be a code of a certain length that gets within epsilon of the right fidelity. Uh -huh. Right. So, okay. So, mm -hmm. so zero versus non-zero error is it's very sen it's sensitive to. Um, it's not too sensitive to. Uh, it's not too sensitive to uh, the error. Um, uh, however, okay. So classically, we know it's very. It's it's sort of like. The, it, you don't get anything by allowing a little bit more error. Like the, the error, if you, as you, if you try to exceed the capacity, goes uh, uh, sort of exponentially approaches one as the number of uh, channel uses uh, that you get. Quantumly, we, those are called the strong converse. Quantumly, we don't, uh, we don't understand strong converses at the moment. And it's true, there may be some trade-off between exceeding the capacity that you can achieve with fidelity approaching one and um, uh, and uh, uh, how bad it is that you're going to get at the output. We know that you can't, like the capacity is kind of the spot where, where you can't get fidelity. There's sort of, your fidelity is bounded away from one uh, for all codes that exceed capacity, but we don't have a good handle on sort of we would like to be able to say it just goes, the, uh, the fidelity goes to zero if you try to exceed the capacity, but we actually don't have, uh, have statements like that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sure. So a noisy quantum channel, what's that? It's just, uh, well, a noiseless evolution is a unitary um, interaction and a noisy uh, quantum evolution is just a unitary interaction with some ex inaccessible environment. So you put in your row, it interacts with some uh, some inaccessible degrees of freedom, then uh, those get traced out and B ends up in a more mixed state because there was some entanglement between E and B. And you can think of it like, well, these inaccessible degrees of freedom are, are the, the sort of parts of the optical fiber that say absorb light that you try to send across it. Uh, we need to think of channels in this way because the capacity, the quantum capacity, we can characterize in terms of a correlation measure that that mm, 
is meant to capture the the kind of well <laughs> what does it capture it captures the performance of of uh, random uh, random codes um, for transmission over a given channel um, and basically what you do to write down this coherent information is you make an arbitrary state on three parties using some entangled input. Uh, so you have psi R B E. That's just like, you know, if I trace out E that uh, uh, row R B is going to be the state that Alice and Bob can make by using this noisy channel. And the coherent information is given, there are many, well, there are multiple different ways to write it down, but it's the one I like best is, is this one. It's half the maximum over input state. And what you evaluate is the mutual information between the reference state and B, how much correlation they have, minus the same, the mutual information between the same reference state and E. So it's something like how much more uh, mutual information can you get through to B uh, uh, than you get through to E. That's the amount of stuff that you might expect you can send quantumly, or that's the amount of quantum information you might expect that you can send um, from the input to the receiver of the channel. So this thing, this Q1 is called the coherent information. The half is there to normalize it since, the, since when I take a, a, a maximally entangled state over a perfect channel, I get the mutual information of a maximally entangled state, which is twice log the dimension instead of just log the dimension. So that you just throw in this half to make sure you, you normalize the thing right. Um, and the nice thing about it is you can achieve it. Um, so yeah, uh, Lloyd Chor and Devitak each, uh, each had arguments suggesting, uh, well, showing it, <laughs> I don't wanna wade into this proving thing. Uh, uh, Devitak, oops. For with increasing levels of rigor, Lloyd Chor and Devitak showed that this quantum, this Q1, this coherent information is, uh, is achievable. So there are codes that are um, uh, 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 that that have this rate, and furthermore, if you if you regularize this coherent information, if you take the limit as the number of channel uses goes to infinity of the normalized coherent information of of that many channel uses, uh, that thing just is the quantum capacity and can't be exceeded. Um, the trouble with this is this it, it, this involves an optimization over an infinite number of variables. So there's kind of a very limited number of quantum channels where we can actually evaluate this quantum uh, capacity. We can get this lower bound, we can cook up upper bounds, and generally they're pretty far apart. Uh, and even actually, we don't have a good way to test whether the quantum capacity of a quantum channel uh, is zero or, or strictly positive. So there's, there's a lot sort of hindered, a lot is hindered by the fact that uh, we have this regularization that we don't, we're not very good at handling, including indeed the, the, um, uh, the proof of a strong converse. Although I think, I, I think that in that case, it's, it's even more challenging than some of the questions we still don't know how to answer. So let, let's look a little bit more at uh, additivity and non-additivity. And don't worry, this outline is wrong. It has a, a section here that we're not even going to do. Uh, so additivity, as I said, it tells you resources only interact trivially. Um, and non-additivity tells you there's some non-trivial interaction. And yeah, bread is more work to make than a smoothie, but also there are benefits to it. Um, so there, there are channels, quantum channels, that have additive coherent information and therefore for which we can evaluate the quantum capacity. They're cool. They're called degradable channels. And the, basically they're the channels where if Bob decides that he would rather have the environment's output than his own output, uh, he can do some, there's some physical operation he could do to degrade his output to get an equivalent output that the environment's got. Basically there's a channel that lets the channel from uh, A to B turn into the channel from A to E. So Bob can degrade to get the environmental channel. In that case, the coherent information is, uh, is additive and the quantum capacity is given by uh, the coherent information. And I can actually do this optimization. It's not, it's not even that hard. Like, like it's, it's, a convex, it's a convex problem. Um, this teaches us something. Uh, 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 first of all, uh, for some channels, this co coherent information is right. So it's not totally ridiculous. Uh, it also sort of illustrates the non-additivity of 
the uh, of the uh, coherent information is very closely connected to well, the kind of information that gets sent to the environment. You basically get additivity of coherent information when the output of the channel kind of uh, uh, dominates the output of the environment. When it can it can sort of get any information that the environment has. Uh, that's when you get additivity, and therefore, you sort of, it's pointing us towards considering as we design our correcting codes a more explicit uh, connection to uh, both the environment between both the sender and the receiver and the sender and the environment. Um, in fact, there's a relationship: the quantum capacity of a channel cannot exceed the single letter coherent information Q1 plus the private capacity of that channel. Uh, uh, sorry, of the uh, complementary channel. This should say N E or N C. Um, the, the trouble is that most channels actually aren't degradable, so, so we're kind of left in a, in a sticky situation if you're trying to evaluate uh, uh, what's, the best, what's the best way to attack the noise that you're dealing with. Um, and, well, let me just say a little bit more about what's going on when we have non-additivity of coherent information. Um, it, it, basically, the way you achieve Q1, the coherent information, is you look at the input state, the optimal input state, that gives you some row A, and then you take a bunch of copies of that and you try to make a code that looks a lot like row A. So you just take, if you, you, you take what's called the typical subspace of row A and you choose a random code on that space of the right size, you know, equal to the size of the, co equal to the coherent information or two to the N times coherent information. And you can show for that case, uh, um that you uh you uh, uh basically you decouple from the environment and therefore all of your quantum information goes right through to the uh to the receiver um what it means when we look at a multi-letter formula when we find that evaluating the coherent information on a few copies is strictly bigger than evaluating it on a single copy uh it means that you you have to pick some density matrix on n copies of the input and kind of take a bigger, uh, take a code randomly from, from the typical space of that density matrix. So there's some extra structure and correlation between, uh, between different systems when you uh, design your code words um, that let you do better uh, than just choosing randomly. Uh, I Ideally, we'd like some kind of compact prescription for generating uh, telling you what the capacity is given uh, given uh, the description of n, but that we don't have that at the moment. And and there's so many there are lots of examples of channels with non-additive coherent information, sort of very natural ones like the depolarizing channel, um, very funny looking ones that do strange things like uh, this this there's a design here by Qubit and friends that um, it, if you give them a, an an n they'll make sure that the first n coherent informations are zero, but that at some later point, the coherent information goes positive. So this is kind of step zero for them, of, I think, trying to show that, that um, there's no good prescription for evaluating quantum capacities. Um, but uh, I think that, well, that program, I'm not sure if it's, if well, we don't know yet if there are good prescriptions for evaluating quantum capacities of a quantum channel. Uh, another example is what we call the dephrasure channel. It's just the concatenation of a dephasing channel and, uh, and an erasure channel. And each of these two are degradable and therefore we know their quantum capacities, but their concatenation uh, is not. And in fact, it shows uh, pretty substantial non-additivities. Um, I think the time is such that I will Skip, this is another example of a, of a very simple channel described in terms of its isometry uh, that has non-additive coherent information. And that's very exciting to me. It's sort of one of the things I've been looking at because it's so simple that it seems one ought to be able to understand it. And yet there are things happening that we, we can't quite understand yet. It, okay, I will say a little more about it. Basically what it does is at the input, if you, if you feed it a zero, it gives you a maximally mixed state, or let S be a half. It gives you a maximally mixed state between zero and one at the output and at the receiver, or sorry, at the output and at the environment. And then the second input, if you if you input a one, it, it maps on the environment, on the environment it maps one to one, and on the 
uh, on the output of the channel, it maps one to two, so an orthogonal state to this input. And then the these two, if we just restrict our attention to the first two uh, signal states, the channel is degradable and I can tell you the quantum capacity. Uh, if you add this extra signal state, which sends two, it sends no extra information to the output. It only sends extra information to the environment by telling the environment, it gives you sort of an extra qubit signal to the environment that you could use. Suddenly the thing is not only not degradable, it starts to do non-additive stuff with other channels. So this is to us, I think the most promising, uh, 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 the most promising hint on understanding non-additivity at the moment is this small channel and the fact that it's doing some kind of non-additivity that's very different from what we've seen before. Um, so non-additivity, it's, it's a matter of uh, quantum resources acting on trivially. Uh, and the goal is to develop clean examples that help us work towards general coding strategies. There are new features of this, this VS channel that point towards a different way of thinking about coding. And, and I think it's, it's pretty um, promising for developing new coding strategies that go beyond the random, random coding approach uh, that tells you about achievability of coherent information. Uh, I will skip these and I will move to uh, now the last section on quantifying uh, quantum correlations. So given some multi-party state, uh, you might like to know how, how much correlation does it have and what kind of correlations are they and what can you do with them and how hard are they to make? Are they classical? Are they quantum? For two-party pure states, you kind of answer the question by looking at the entanglement entropy and for two-party mixed states, uh, well, we know a lot of stuff. We know about distillable entanglement. We know about squashed entanglement. We know about all sorts of entanglement measures. But for multiple parties, things are pretty, pretty uh, basic. Um, so we, we have some information about, like, if I give you a five-party state, what's, what's, what are the different kinds of, uh, what are the different kinds of correlations it could have and how do we measure them? But what I want to tell you about now is, is kind of a systematic way of trying to understand um, what sort of focusing on measures of the correlations that we can define in terms of entropies, what, what different um, functions of entropies are kind of telling us something about the correlations that uh, sit in a multipartite state. So there are a couple of things I know. First, local operations cannot make correlations. If they can, I'm not calling it a correlation. I'll call it something. I'll even take that as the definition of a correlation. It's the stuff that you cannot make locally. Um, the other thing I know is when we do information theory, uh, if you want your uh, measure to mean something, you had better use von Neumann entropies. It's, it's not a bad idea. Sort of most of the problems we've, we know the solution to in information theory the answers are almost always in terms of linear combinations of entropies. So we should look for linear combinations of entropies that kind of, well, they can't, that can't go up if you do some local operation. So this is, this is the general plan. We want to find all the linear combinations of entropies that don't increase under local processing. And these actually, they form a cone uh, in the two to, two to the n minus one dimensional space of formulas for n parties, basically, you know, in my formula, I can have an entropy of A1, an entropy of A2, et cetera, et cetera. Or I could have an entropy of A1, A2, A1, A2, A3. And there are two to the n uh, choices I could make since I don't, uh, two, except I leave one out because I, I know what the entropy of no systems is. It's nothing. So that's uh, why we get only two to the n minus one dimensional space. And we can simply characterize what are the, what are the linear combinations that uh, that satisfy this extra uh, constraint that that they don't go up under uh, under uh, um, under local processing. And the nice thing is they all follow from strong subadditivity, so we don't have to worry too much about um, extra inequalities. Um, specifically, we don't know whether von Neumann entropy satisfies some additional inequalities beyond strong subadditivity. Uh, we kind of think they do; it does, but we don't know how to prove it. Um, we do know that, for example, for holographic states, there are these extra inequalities. <coughs> I can talk later about how that influences this analysis. Um, but right now, I, I, 
Uh, wait, wait, Graham, can I interrupt yeah. with a question? Go ahead. Sorry, a local operation means um, something not necessarily unitary just on one of those things? Yeah, so it could be, it's a unitary followed by a partial trace. Oh, I see, okay. Um, I see, okay, go ahead, thanks. So uh, these are just some examples of uh, optimized formulas um, uh, that um, I left out a slide, but that's okay, because I'm also a little short on time. So here are some examples of optimized formulas. Here's the point I wanted to bring here. Um, you can actually just write down some linear combinations of entropies that uh, don't increase uh, under, uh, under local operations. One of them is, for example, mutual information. Um, but there are other ones, not for two parties. For two parties, basically mutual information is it. Uh, for three parties and four parties and five parties, there are extra correlation measures that, um, that uh, just some other kind of correlation, uh, 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 but are not sim simply, uh, uh, say, mutual information between different sets of parties. Um, maybe I, if in the discussion, I can say a little something about the connection between this and I3 um, that is, is a little bit funny uh, because it doesn't fall into the set of uh, uh, correlation measures as I've defined it, uh, because uh, we, we can find, well, because there are examples where uh, you can make it go up by doing some local operation. It's really actually a difference of two, two correlation measures uh, that measure different sorts of correlations. And understanding that connection actually is, is something that I, I, maybe this crowd would be, would be helpful in, uh, in doing. Okay, but now let me move on to uh, the optimized formulas, which are, well, like the coherent information or the entanglement assisted capacity or the squashed entanglement. Um, you just have, you introduce some auxiliary system R and you optimize over, uh, over that system or over the state on that system. That gives you a way of uh, understanding the uh, uh, sort of how much correlation you can generate with, say, a quantum channel. You can do the same thing for quantum states. So if I have some row AB, I could minimize over some linear combination of entropies evaluated on an extension of row AB. So what's an extension? I just insist that the reduced density matrix of row ABV correspond to row AB, AB when I trace out V. And then I minimize over that extended, uh, that, that auxiliary system V, <clears throat> this, this F of alpha. Uh, alpha is just, a, it's a vector that characterizes the coefficients in this linear combination. We can ask now in these optimized formulas, when do I have, uh, have a monotonic formula? And in fact, we get a cone of coefficients that give optimized monotones. And the rays of the cone are, are sort of particularly interesting because they capture something like the, the basic uh, different kinds of correlations that you can get. So for uh, bipartite correlation measures, we can go off and say, what are all the linear combinations of entropies that when minimized give you something monotonic? Uh, uh, the three ones I wanna highlight today, although I've forgotten here to include the, uh, the, uh, the squashed entanglement here, are EP, the entanglement of purification, EQ, uh, which measures, uh, well, it's, it's this linear combination of, uh, of uh, entropies minimized, and ER. So these are kind of, what we did is we just look for correlation measures that satisfy some criteria. Uh, the criterion is just monotonicity under local processing on both sides. And we asked, uh, uh, well, we found a cone of all the coefficients that would give rise to this. And then uh, we took the rays of the cone. So these are the, uh, again, with squash entanglement, these are the sort of four special correlation measures that we find. Um, and uh, you might like to know, well, what are they, uh, what are they measuring? Lung, Debbie Lung and, and her colleagues, um, uh, Hordetsky, DiVincenzo, Terhal, I think that's all. Um, in 2002, they found uh, this entanglement of purification, and, uh, and uh, these two correlation measures are new, and the nice thing about them that we really like is that they're additive. Uh, uh, entanglement of purification, we don't know if it's additive, uh, but uh, 
we're think, we think probably not. There are kind of good examples where it looks like it's non-additive, but, uh, but it's not that we can, we can show such a thing. Okay, so this actually is, is why uh, I'm here kind of, because this uh, entanglement purification I had known about for a while and somebody told me, oh, the, the string theorists like entanglement purification. Um, so I couldn't, it didn't seem right to me, but uh, uh, it turned out to be true. Uh, I, I, I'm gonna skip this slide. You, you, you are all deeply familiar with ADS-CFT and the RT formula. And I, I'm willing to bet that I'm actually the least expert in this area uh, on the call. So I'm just gonna show you these pictures and remind you of what the RT formula is. And then I'm gonna say, well, um, if you're looking at the entanglement wedge, you might wonder what properties of, uh, of the boundary state tell me uh, about the sort of shape of the entanglement wedge. So the thing that got me kind of excited in this area was seeing this conjecture of Takinaga and Yumamoto and also Swingle and friends, uh, where they argued that the, the uh, cross section of this entanglement wedge uh, for a uh, bipartite, uh, well, for a, for a holographic bipartite state, the cross section of the entanglement wedge should be equal to up to a constant, uh, the entanglement of purification. Uh, that's pretty cool. Um, and why do they think this? I mean, there are multiple arguments. Uh, first of all, there's um, sort of an argument via the surface state correspondence, which uh, uh, I guess I'll leave it to you whether you think it's whether you think it's likely to be true. Um, what really I guess is more of interest to me, I would say, is is thinking of things in terms of te tensor networks. You know, whatever you believe about ADS-CFT and uh, and uh, surface state correspondences and so forth, uh, if you have a tensor network uh, that that kind of is a, a toy model uh, of ADS-CFT, you kind of can believe in the surface state correspondence pretty. Uh, I mean, pretty confidently, at least for the tensor network and thinking of uh, the areas of things in terms of how many legs you cut, stuff like that. So uh, based on the surface state correspondence, uh, the, these, uh, uh, these folks pointed out that, uh, that kind of the best purification or the best extension of row AB, uh, if you have an AB sitting on the boundary here, uh, is uh, the one that gives this the part of the 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 part of the uh, uh, the entanglement wedge boundary here uh, closest to A to A, over to A and the part closest to B over to B and then the entropy of uh, big A with little A just gives you according to the surface state correspondence the 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 size uh, the the length of the uh, uh, of the entanglement wedge cross section. So of course we then want to know. Uh, uh, well, what about this EQ and uh, and ER? What, how can we interpret those on uh, on uh, a holographic state? Because we don't even know how to interpret them on a general state. We can evaluate them on some special cases. As usual, we don't really know how to evaluate these formulas because we don't know what the optimal states are, except in some very special situations. But it turns out that holographic states are kind of a nice situation to look at these correlations for because we can kind of figure out what the optimal what the optimal extensions are for these states. And what we found in one case is that uh, this this R correlation E sub R uh, it looks well in <laughs> for all we can tell it's equal to the uh, uh, the entanglement wedge cross section as well. So it looks like it reduces just to the entanglement of purification uh, at least for uh, fairly simple holographic states. The, uh, the, uh, the R correlation, which is the optimization of this formula, it tells us something about how squished the, uh, how squished the, uh, uh, the entanglement wedge is. It's kind of like, well, you take the, <coughs> the heights like this, add them up, and then you subtract the widths, and uh, <clears throat> that gives you this, this Q correlation. Uh, the other thing we found, which is quite cute, I thought, in fact, Oliver found, uh, so I think it's even cuter when a string theorist finds some sort of entropic uh, formula that you, that uh, or some sort of neat entropic identity. I think that's really cool. Uh, we found that all of the entropy of A we can interpret at least for holographic states as well. How much uh, Q correlation do you have with B? How much 
well, what is the Q correlation? We don't quite know, but how much, Q cor how much correlation is measured by EQ do you have with B? That's some of A's entropy, and that accounts for some of the A's entropy. And the rest of A's entropy can be accounted for by an old thing that we, we uh, came up with sort of, I don't know, 15 years ago. Uh, it's a kind of distillable entanglement of, of uh, a state. And it tells us that basically A's entropy is all in either entanglement that can be distilled from the environment of row AB to A, or in some kind of correlation with uh, B. And, and that's kind of like, uh, 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 that's a clean splitting. You can do a similar game for multipartite correlations and extract even more information about, uh, about the entanglement wedge of those uh, uh, multipartite states. Um, uh, we, uh, you can see that it's sort of asking questions and answering questions about slightly different uh, different things going on for the various correlation measures we have. Uh, we have sort of five non-trivial ones there, and they tell us about uh, five different kind of optimization points along the uh, along the uh, um, along the the surface of the entanglement wedge. Um, so I wanted to sort of push the idea that holographic states, you know, they they can be quite useful for understanding quantum information, in particular via this formula we are able to find a non-trivial example where we can, we can calculate the, uh, uh, the distillable entanglement uh, or the SS distillable entanglement, the symmetric side channel assisted distillable entanglement of a state that, uh, uh, that is not, um, there's not in any class that we know of to be solvable. Uh, so it kind of gives us a more, uh, a more, it's sort of complicated enough to give us non-trivial optimizations, but but simple enough to actually give us optimizations that we can evaluate. And that's a pretty rare thing to find uh, for uh, general states. So I, I already I'm thinking that these holographic states are a really useful tool uh, for just for understanding quantum information itself. Um, it seems nice enough for holographic states that additivity is more common than it is to be uh, in for general states. So. Uh, the entanglement of purification is not thought to be additive in general, but is thought to be additive for holographic states. And it, it's seeding some conjectures that we have about, for example, the relationship between the regularized entanglement of purification, which has an operational understanding in terms of the entanglement cost of preparing rho AB, and this, uh, this R correlation, which is, which is an additive thing. Um, so we, there seems to be a tight relationship between them. And uh, the best information we have about that so far is, is from evaluating uh, both, both quantities on, uh, on holographic states. So uh, I guess in summary, uh, information theory is about how, how resources interact. Quantum theory has much more, um, much more uh, robust interactions between, uh, between the res different resources um, in the form of, you know, basically a generic uh, presence of non-additivity. This is challenging. It means it's hard for us to evaluate capacities and to understand stuff. It's an opportunity because there's a possibility of finding better recipes for uh, quantum error correcting codes and also better, uh, even better recipes for new effects, like stuff like um, uh, uh, um, sort of, uh, well, I, I skipped the slides on superactivation, but basically, uh, you know, finding new ways to to encode information so that it, so that it's robust against noise. Um, I then talked about some nice measures, basically looking for nice ax taking an axiomatic approach to correlation measures and trying to see what different kinds of multi-party correlations they can measure. We don't yet have operational understandings of most of these, um, but my sort of the optimist in me says that when you have a nice a nice measure when it's additive, when it behaves, that's telling you that that it ought to be um, it ought to have some good operational understanding as well, because after all, the world is a nice place. So we should always be able to find that our nice answers are answers to nice questions. Um, they also admit geometrical interpretations for holographic states, and that lets us do the uh, the optimizations explicitly in some cases and see examples of states for which we can evaluate, uh, say, distillable entanglement, uh, even though it's not possible uh, in general to do that. I just wanted to say thank you uh, for listening to me and invite further discussion. These are, 
this is the latest group photo I have. These are all my students and postdocs. Here's Vikesh. Um, uh, when we were still doing remote group meetings, I'm glad we, well, I, knock on wood, we don't ever have to uh, do these remote group meetings again. Uh, they weren't very pleasant, uh, but, uh, 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 well, I guess I'm also looking forward to seeing all of you in person sometime, maybe next year at, a, at, a next, at the next uh, consortium uh, meeting. Uh, with that, I can answer any questions uh, you might have. Uh, Okay. okay, and once again, um, I will first uh, take questions from people who are willing to have those questions recorded and made public, and then I will turn off the recording. Anyone? Yeah, yeah. Well, I have a question. So, <laughs> Graham, you, you talked about these optimized uh, uh, quantities. Now, I, I wonder whether, uh, so, so in, in, in relation to entanglement of purification um, and, and the holographic formula, I actually am partial to the view that the entanglement rich cross section actually computes a slightly different object, um, not an entirely, um, not, not the entanglement of purification optimized over all purifications, but rather an object that's associated with a particular canonical purification. This is something that Faulkner and Data proposed. And sure. in their language, it's much cleaner to see why the entanglement rich cross section appears directly from the geometric construction. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether, uh, uh, in, in light of what you were saying, whether holography is better at doing partially optimized um, information measures rather than truly optimized information measures, and whether such measures are useful in quantum information um, more generally. Can you tell me about partially optimized? Partially optimized. So, so here, when I, so, so the so instead of purifying, looking at this, over the space of all possible purifications, you mm -hmm. pick a particular purification that's canonical in a, in, a, in, a, in a certain sense. So in some sense, the way the, way the, the, state, the statement of um, uh, these, these folks works is you, you sort of purify it as if you build a thermophile double state yeah. from, this de, from, this de, from the partial density, density matrix. So it's, it's not sort of truly trying to optimize over all possible purifications. But you try to sort of optimize, but you try to not not quite optimize, but but really get something that's canonical, and that canonical mm -hmm. thing is what holography seems to more naturally land on when you when you do the computation. Uh huh. Um, and the question for you is whether do you see any role for such canonical stuff or or optimizations over subspaces of purifications useful for QI purposes? Um. Yes, although I, I guess my optimist thinks that if I'm not mistaken, we don't yet have um, an argument that their canonical purification is not the optimal purification. That is true. That um, is true. Yes. And I would be happier if we found that. Uh -huh. But um, you can cert what you can certainly do, right, is go back to any of the correlation measures we have and say, well, okay, if assuming an operational interpretation of these measures, which I don't have at the moment, but hope to get, yeah? Uh, then you can always go to the sort of, uh, the extension that was chosen, the, the canonical one that's most natural to you and say, well, does this represent, now this should represent sort of an achievable rate for some protocol. If it's not the optimal value, then you could do better by some other purification, but uh, um, it would still sort of, uh, I guess, um, kind of give us a sense for how far away also it was from the optimal purification. The thing that I've actually been meaning to do, I would love to do, but we didn't do, and maybe, okay, anyway, basically we have all these, these optimized correlation measures. You could just take the canonical purifications mm -hmm. suggested by Faulkner and- uh, Data. Data. Um, and, and sort of evaluate the argument that you were you were um, that you were optimizing that, that you were optimizing and see if there's some geometrical thing to it. Right. Okay. Um, I mean, I think that uh, if one can argue that the optimized purification is a geometric one, then I think it should be follow very trivially that it's that one, which is the thermophile double. The and it's very oh. natural to expect that the that the 
<laughs> purification should be geometric one being brought up in the yes and it's natural not to want to have to prove it context but yeah right, but right, right. i have a question okay <laughs> so hey, first of all first of all beautiful talk grant i really enjoyed that so my question is this that um so one of the cool things that i kind of learned today was that a very nice characterization of what makes quantum mechanics weird is that uh, you can have super additivity of the channel capacity, which you know just wouldn't happen classically. Are yeah. there any holographic examples, or is there a no go saying you can't do this holographically? I don't know of any examples. And the thing that we've just sort of empirically seen is it, it tends to look additive. Um, but I I don't know of a no go either. Well, my cool thing to do. Uh, I, I wonder if there's a way of either proving a no go or coming up with an example because that's just such a crisp thing where, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it just can't be super additive in classical physics. Anyway, very cool, interesting. Thanks. Are there more questions? We can also turn off the recording. Yeah, I'll turn this off now unless someone really wants to clarify. Now ask the insulting ones. Okay, off we go. <laughs>